Bible study for Sunday the 8th of August, being the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, proper 14 in lectionary year B. And we begin our lesson in 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, that may ring a bell for some of you that we're in the wilderness, Elijah's in the wilderness. So the Elijah, the man of God, has had to leave the court because the queen is seeking to have him killed, Queen Jezebel, who is uh, serving foreign gods. Uh, and after a day's journey into the wilderness, uh, Elijah sits down under a solitary broom tree and says, I've had enough, I want to die. This is a pattern. He's, he's ready to give up all the time, and the Lord keeps telling him what to do to arise and do the next thing. And uh, an angel comes to Elijah here and says, get up and eat. And Elijah looks and there's a cake baked on hot stones, a jar of water, he eats and he drinks. And the angel comes a second time and says, get up and eat again, otherwise this journey will be too much for you. He gets up, he does it, and he gets enough strength for 40 days and 40 nights to journey to Mount Horeb, the Mount of God. Now. Elsewhere in scripture, Mount Horeb is referred to as Mount Sinai. This is where we get the law. And so being called to the wilderness there gives us a signal that God is going to show up because throughout scripture, God shows up in the wilderness, whether it's a pillar of fire, a cloud, a burning bush. God never shows up in the city. God shows up when all the other distractions are gone. In fact, if we look at prayer practices and other forms of spirituality, we get two broad classifications. One's called apophatic spirituality, A-P-O, and the other is called cataphatic spirituality, K-A-T-A. -A. Now let's do the second one first. Kata in Greek means according to or by this. So cataphatic, phasis, way of doing things. Cataphatic spirituality would be that you say these particular prayers, uh, that we use these canticles at morning prayer, that we recite these psalms, that we have different prayer practices about when we stand or kneel or cross ourselves or what time of day, etc., etc. Apophatic, A-P-O in Greek means against or going away from means not according to this. And the idea behind apophatic spirituality is that when we have removed everything that might be a distraction from our lives, we might see where God is or how God shows up in our lives. And so apophatic spirituality, we can think of hermits. We can think of silent contemplation. We can think of a silent monastery. We can think of doing things where we're trying to remove all forms of distraction. This has always been a minority way of doing things, and in our current day and age where we are bombarded with distractions, with multiple screens and devices and things of that sort, uh, apophatic spirituality becomes more and more of a challenge. I personally have spent several weeks in a silent monastery, and I can actually recommend it. And this for a person who's kind of a motor mouth. So uh, once you sort of get into a different rhythm of things, you start paying attention in different ways and noticing all the ways God is present in your life. If you're interested in apophatic spirituality and exploring it, see Father Jeff, see me, and we'll give you some resources to start exploring that. But let's look at this lesson. And we see what's happening with Elijah. Let's put it in context. Well, this is Elijah in the midst of pilgrimage to Mount Horeb, where we get the various theophanies of God to Moses. And he's laying complaints before God. These complaints arise from the contest between the worship of the Lord and the worship of Baal. And so we've had uh, Elijah and the priests of Baal, and the idol of Baal keeps falling down. Uh, the result is that the prophet keeps getting mistreated at the hands of Ahab and the people. The king remains attached to Baal because his queen Jezebel is a servant of Baal and the prophet has to flee. 
The prophet flees to the southern desert and loses strength and hope in this hostile environment. He therefore just wants to die, but is given miraculous sustenance. And we're told that he goes on for 40 days. Now, whenever the number 40 shows up in the Old Testament, don't take it literally. 40 is meant to refer to multiples of things a lot. So it raining for 40 days and 40 nights in the flood account means that it rained for a very long time. Elijah journeying for 40 days and 40 nights means that he is journeying for a very long time. Uh, the prophet's journey becomes a pilgrimage out of the ordinary world and into a sacred place. And throughout the Bible, we can look upon the wilderness as a place where the presence of God becomes more apparent. Notice, even in the New Testament accounts, when Jesus gets worn out by the crowds, he withdraws to a lonely place, Eremon in Greek, which also means wilderness. This begs the question where in our two busy lives we have space that we can retreat to. Uh, I would encourage you in your own daily lives to set aside some time, maybe even a particular place, where you can unplug, take some time to offer thanksgivings to God and to listen to what God has to say to you today. In our psalm this week, we are in Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8, an individual song of thanksgiving. In Hebrew, the psalm is an acrostic addressing the just and encouraging them to join the psalmist in praising God. The content of the psalm basically reflects the wisdom teaching that there are two ways to live. One is the way of the Lord and one is to follow our own pathway, which will inevitably lead us away from God. The wisdom theme here is of the fear of the Lord. To fear the Lord is to acknowledge his supremacy over all things. Now, we're finishing up Ephesians this week, uh, finishing up chapter 4 and getting into the beginning of chapter 5, in which Paul is contrasting Christian and non-Christian living, non-Christian conduct in the section from 417 to 520. The verses selected for this lesson present a series of moral exhortations that illustrate the conduct proper to Christians who have in baptism put on a new nature. And the motivation includes common membership in one body, again, as last week, that theme of unity. The care for the poor, we are to reach out in uh, charity. In other words, uh, we are our brother's keepers. The edification of one's fellows, the imitation of God, the imitation of Jesus. Uh, we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit means we're saying one thing and doing another, or we're using God in prayer to try to have God serve our own needs our own wants, our own ends, rather than God's ends. The community-centered nature of the exhortations, remember Paul's using a plural here, y'all, not singular you, suggests that an offense against a fellow member of the church is an offense against the Holy Spirit. If we were to really think that and believe that on an ongoing basis, we'd be a lot more careful about how we live within the body of the church. Paul is making the point that this is an offense against the Holy Spirit for all Christians together form a living temple in which the Spirit dwells. Uh, the vices which are listed are those which are disruptive of the common life. They don't build up the body. What we are supposed to do in living a godly life is build up the one body. The mark of Christian life, in other words, is to be an imitator of God, and this means love of neighbor, with this love being manifested in sacrificial giving and care. Hard to do. Basically impossible to do, 
if we are not in Christ. Impossible in the sense that treating people who are radically different from who we are is something we are not wont to do. We don't want to do it either. It's scary. It's foreign. It will stretch us. I had uh, a meal recently with a young person contemplating going to seminary and entering the priesthood, and I explained to him that while I have had jobs that have included being a litigator and even in death penalty litigation, uh, being in corporations working on a deal up to the value of seven billion dollars, being in uh, another career in which I had to carry a weapon and had my life threatened on a number of cases, uh, being a parish priest was actually the hardest thing I ever did, the most stressful. First of all, because you can't hold anybody accountable. But secondly, because everybody comes to the church saying, what have you got for me? Rather than what are they bringing to the church? And you're dealing with other people's problems. And so the easiest thing in the world for any of us to do would be to write folks off and say, we don't care, not my problem. But what Paul and what all scripture testify to is that when we're looking at brothers and sisters under scripture, it is our problem. That's why it's so stressful. And so being imitators of God is impossible if we are not in Christ. Paul is gonna hammer that point to us repeatedly because it's one we can't get around. Now, when we get to our lesson from the sixth chapter of John, last week Jesus said, I am the bread from heaven. Uh, and the people have said, give us this bread, right? And so we had the Samaritan woman at the well in chapter four saying, give me this living water. Now the people in reference to the bread are saying, give us this bread. And what does Jesus do? Well, first he has one of those I am sayings using the holy name of the Lord. And we talked about that more extensively last week, but now the focus shifts to a dispute over Jesus's origin. Here the people are murmuring just as last week in our lesson from Exodus, they were murmuring against Moses. They're complaining, they're plotting, they're scheming. Our translation, in fact, has the people complain. The word John uses in the Greek is closer to the Hebrew root for murmur used in Exodus when the people complain in the wilderness for lack of water or for lack of food. Murmuring in Exodus, and the echo we're supposed to get here in the Greek of John, is an example of unbelief. Jesus has just provided bread from heaven. Jesus has just said who he is, and people are expressing unbelief. Jesus' command that the people not murmur is followed by a series of sayings which encapsulate teaching on the nature of belief. Those who have faith in Jesus do so because they are drawn to faith by the Father. In other words, we are given faith as a gift, which is also listed as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the letters of Paul. Uh, we can compare John 12, 44, for example. Faith in Jesus is faith in God. Faith in him who sent me is what the Christ says. Those who have faith in Jesus will be raised by him on the last day. There is no knowledge of God apart from Jesus. Now, let's work on that word knowledge, first of all. Gnosis in Greek. Knowledge throughout the Bible is not just cognition. It's not what we know about things in terms of facts and how they fit together. Knowledge, much more so throughout scripture, is how we experience something, how we participate in something. It can be as graphic as uh, Genesis saying, and Adam knew his wife and she begat a son. Knowledge in that sense is how the two become one flesh. Uh, it is experiential. And that is what Jesus is saying here, that we cannot have knowledge of God 
apart from Jesus, the one whom God sent. We cannot be taught by God apart from hearing and believing the words of Jesus Christ. So we have to pay attention. Jesus contrasts the life which comes from participation in the Eucharist, in his body and blood, with the death of the Israelites in the wilderness. So the Eucharist is here equated with the I am in Christ. Now, this is where we get into Eucharistic theology. And in uh, the Catholic and Orthodox traditions, whether we're talking Roman Catholic or Anglican, or whether we're talking Eastern Orthodox in terms of Greek or Russian or something else, we are talking about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. We argue about how this happens. The Roman Catholics, for example, say that it happens by transubstantiation, that the substance of the bread becomes the substance of Jesus' body. Substance being a Greek philosophical term for the real underlying stuff that we're made up of. Uh, in Anglicanism, there are those who believe in transubstantiation. I'm one of them, which is why I genuflect in front of the uh, uh, Eucharist, for example. Uh, you don't have to believe in transubstantiation in Anglicanism, but we do teach the real presence, which is that Jesus is really present in the celebration of the Eucharist. And maybe we don't know how, but we say he's present. That's what he's saying in scripture here, uh, that he is really present in the I am in the Eucharist. Where we get into other Eucharistic theological debates is if we say real present is what happens, then we get into debates over whether there is a fresh sacrifice in the mass or not. Is there a fresh offering of Jesus in this bread and this wine, this body, this blood? Or are we participating in a timeless sense in the one offering of Jesus' body and blood on the cross? It doesn't matter when we recognize that in the Eucharist, time goes away. We participate in eternity. That's why we say in the Eucharistic canon, therefore with angels, and archangels and with all the company of heaven we ever laud and praise thee and go on in the prayer because we're saying that in each celebration of the Eucharist the kingdom of heaven breaks into this world. So these Eucharistic debates at the end really don't matter. If we deny the real presence they do matter. And so in the form of theology we would find for example in the Baptist Church we get what is called memorialism, where uh, a good Baptist would say there is no fresh sacrifice of the Eucharist of any kind. Uh, this is not anything other than bread and wine or grape juice. And uh, we are just remembering what Jesus did. We are memorializing what Jesus did. One problem with that theology is that the word Jesus uses to say, do this in remembrance of me, the Greek amnesin, is not memory in a cognitive sense of calling something to mind, but memory in the sense of to make me present again. So you can see how these debates have gone on for the last centuries, and they've really gotten us nowhere. But the point is that we participate in God and have knowledge of him by and through Jesus Christ. Uh, life everlasting is par imparted to us through participating in the divinity of Jesus in the Eucharist. Now, we've talked about this before, but I'm gonna repeat it. There are three prayers that the priest says when the elements are offered for the celebration of the Eucharist. They used to be called secret prayers, some priests say them aloud, some just mumble them. Uh, they reflect the uh, thanksgivings given in the celebration in the temple or in a synagogue. You would find them, for example, at a Seder's supper for Passover. And so first the bread is taken, and the priest says, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your 
Uh, goodness, we have this bread to offer. That's right out of a synagogue service. Baruch atah Adonai Elohei Elocheinu, and it goes from there. We have this bread to offer, work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of heaven. Then the wine is offered. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. And then a little water is poured in the wine, reflecting what comes out of Jesus with that spear. And we say, by the mingling of this water and wine, may we come to share in Christ's divinity as he humbled himself to share in our humanity. With each participation in the Holy Eucharist, we become more and more Christ-like. That's the point Jesus is making in this teaching. Our knowledge of God grows. This is why we celebrate Eucharist weekly and encourage frequent participation. May we in our lives continue to become more and more Christ-like as we grow together in one body. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.